What's up everybody, it's Two Bricks, and I'm back with the next installment of my Think Like a Lego Designer series. I'm back with a now dissected version of my completed Stinger Mantis version 2. So if you guys missed it, I did a full uh, review video. Uh, you can check that in the playlist for my uh, one-off mocks that I have, uh, just a, an ongoing list of all of my different mocks. Uh, I completed the Stinger Mantis and uh, I just kind of gave a full tour and overview of all of the new features and everything. So now what I wanted to do is, um, you know, having now uh, ripped it apart in order to make instructions for it, uh, I wanted to go back and show you guys some of the techniques and things that I employed to uh, achieve this new design. Kind of a little bit of a different uh, focus than I did for the, uh, the Fondor because that one was sort of more of a build up week to week seeing it get closer to being completed and this one is more of a retrospective uh, focusing on smaller specific details but I think that that's actually going to be pretty useful for mock makers who are looking for new ideas and, and ways of thinking about the LEGO system. Uh, so yeah let's just kind of dive in and take a look at all the different weird cool stuff that I had to employ uh, and uh, all the little tips and tricks that I had to pull out of my tool chest to be able to achieve this model. So uh, yeah, let's dive right in. All right, so the first thing I wanted to talk about is that I redesigned these uh, rings which hold the wings in place. And the reason for that is that the seed piece for this entire kind of the inspiration for wanting to do this whole mod uh, was these round pieces uh, being able to slot in and interact with, um, you know, the spine and be freely moving, etc. You've seen the first one, you know, right? Uh, problem is that the way that these pieces are designed there isn't enough of a flat surface along the top ridge or along the top edge of this to uh, lock it in meaningfully to any kind of um, plate, right? So the, the more that you try, or I guess however much you try to clamp these down, there's always going to be this sense of flex. And I don't know if you can really see that on camera, but it's like changing shape fairly dramatically. Um, and so that, that was just something that I was unable to removed from the design and so the weight of the top wing and the side wing were causing that that drooping to, to happen and it was causing a lot of kind of wiggle uh, and flex in the wings that I, that I wanted to eliminate. So my solution for that was to just simply redesign a shape like this that would have the same ability to rotate around that that cylinder uh, base but not rely on these um, quarter round macaroni castle tower type pieces. Oh, and I should mention the other reason that I wanted to redesign it is because the actual um, dimensions of these ended up being a little bit off when I when I placed it in against the body. Uh, there just wasn't enough bulk in there and um, it, it just kind of looked wrong. Um, sorry, let me just place this on here. So yeah, the, the, uh, the rings didn't come out far enough. And so it just looked off in proportion to the rest of the body. And I wanted to keep the scale of the mantis roughly the same. So I had two things I had to solve there, which was one, making the rings wider and two, making them more sturdy. So uh, this was my solution right here after uh, much iteration. The actual, uh, the front and back rings are a little bit different uh, in their design. So the back rings here have uh, these gaps on either side of these central sections and the front ones do not. And the reason for that is that uh, this part in the back here is where the, the two prongs of the, um, uh, the catch that holds everything in place uh, have to have room to go through. So I, I designed it in such a way that there would be uh, gaps in there for that. Um, so yeah, front and back, there you go, you see the difference right there. Um, so what I ended up doing is trying out every single kind of combination of plates interlocking that I could come up with to basically give me the exact dimensions that I need where I could just attach uh, only these tiles, these uh, quarter round macaroni tiles that have the same profile as these bricks. Um, and those would act as the guide to go around the, um, the central you know, section uh, and then just figure out uh, a plate solution that would basically integrate a bunch of four by uh, ones, six by ones, and then uh, corner round, or uh, sorry, corner L-shaped pieces to be able to lock everything together and give me a wider profile around the edge. Um, I've actually, since completing this uh, piece, I've actually gone ahead and redesigned it even a little bit more in uh, the digital file where I've eliminated these little gaps that you see on the side of these sections. So now everything looks uh, like this. It all meets up completely perfectly all the way around on all sides. So that's another little thing I was able to do. Um, I just didn't have the pieces on hand to be able to figure it, figure that out, but then I realized 
that I have unlimited pieces in the computer and I can just go ahead and apply those here. So uh, that was cool. Um, but yeah, so the, the big trick for this was figuring out how to mount these plates at 45 degrees uh, without them wanting to fall off. So previously I was using a one by one uh, bracket that would sit in this little, um, this little anti stud right here at the 45 degree angle. And then those two studs were just gripping onto each of those sections on the corner with the rounded, um, uh, with the curved slope pieces uh, on the outside. Uh, the problem with that was that these sections wanted to fall off all the time, uh, number one. Uh, and when I was rotating the cylinders ar around, um, those, because there was only one stud uh, and there was kind of nothing really supporting it, it was, um, I was finding that it was catching along the edges of the design and it was coming loose and then that would jam. So I'd be trying to turn it and one of those, because um, you know there's four on either side, uh, one of those would be loose and would be uh, sticking. So I ended up coming up with a new solution that I'm very, very, very proud of where I'm using these uh, round one by two um, plates right here with the holes in. And then I'm using a second pair of those on the inside. So you can see right there that come together and meet and give you know the exact because they're able to freely sort of rotate around um, due to the fact that they are round and don't have the squared off edges of regular Lego plates those are able to meet up and give you exactly the right amount of space to put a two by uh, or one by two plate in here and then attach the bracket to that as well so that ended up just working absolutely perfectly and it gives me plenty of clutch power now these are so sturdy and it ended up actually kind of locking the whole design together even more securely as well which is exactly what I wanted so um, yeah there was definitely a lot of benefit to redesigning these even though the the time investment for it was <laughs> considerable um, and it really broke my heart to tear the whole design apart to the the most basic element once I had it almost finished um, to redesign this but I think it definitely was worth doing so um, yeah the design is is leagues above what I was doing previously with this sort of rudimentary castle tower system <laughs> and even though um, technically yes this is a lot a lot more parts dense uh, I think that the strength and the stability that this gives you is absolutely worth the extra expenditure on buying some more um, plates and tiles and things to complete the design so um, there's that and then the central one operates a little bit differently uh, it has a lot of the same type of proportions and geometry but because it's a much thicker piece I was able to take advantage of a lot more a lot more different um, ways of attaching things and uh, yeah essentially the the bulk of this allowed me to figure out different attachment points and things like that um, but I, I don't really want to go too much into this because it is basically it's basically an expansion of this design here but with a lot of modified elements that allow for example the uh, the central wing here to be attached securely and also allowing for the like I said the modifications for those prongs to go in and um, and you know clamp the wings in place so um, but yeah I think this one I tried to minimize the amount of plates and use more bricks you can see in the middle here I have um, more bricks integrated into the design just because I wanted to fill space and um, and you know not have to rely on tons and tons and tons of plates which would just be you know become really really expensive really quickly so I think that I have a really good balance I'm just trying to rip this off to show you guys uh, I have a really good balance I think of plates and bricks in this and yeah the strength is just it's just gnarly so anyway, peel that off as you can see here the way that each of the layers is held in with a uh, bracket piece then the next layer has its own set of brackets and then so on and then all of that just gets clamped together at the end with these side support pieces and it just holds the entire design together very very well and I had to make sure that there's no exposed studs along the top of this so this whole surface on the top had to be completely smooth because obviously that is rotating around uh, up right up against the next ring so you know figuring out how to get all of that to work was was really really tricky um, and then like even down to things like this placing this plate in here at 45 degrees in order to uh, sit up against the edge of this uh, bracket here and kind of try to give that smooth continuous surface as much as possible to avoid anything that wants to um, catch due to like unevenness um, was really really tricky and challenging but very very fun and satisfying once it was all done.
And then, you know, the end result is that you have these parts that come together and meet so seamlessly and smoothly. Uh, and I'm just really, really thrilled with the overall final look. So that's really cool. And then for the landing gear, all I had to do is extend out the design that I had on the first ring where it was, um, you know, this bottom strut here was only two bricks wide. Now it's four or, uh, yeah, f uh, two bricks wide and now it's four bricks wide or four studs wide. And then uh, it was just the same exact design that I had before. So I'm still relying on these clips and these ball joints to hold in the, the gear, but I just expanded it out a little bit to match the new geometry. So that kind of all worked out really, really well. Um, and, you know, finding the specific needs of each of these rings and each of the parts of the rings to perform their different functions was really, really fun and satisfying. It was almost like a puzzle box having to just, you know, <laughs> unlock one piece at a time and very, very carefully adapt and use the right pieces, like a lot of rounded pieces to make sure I'm not interfering with anything in the middle of this rotating section, you know, a lot of those kind of challenges. So, um, but yeah, really, really fun and satisfying stuff. And there you go, really happy with this. Another challenge that I had with the wings was uh, a lot of transitioning between the two, uh, two brick wide build of the ring attachment point and the one brick wide build of the actual wing surface itself. So I'm um, kind of finding ways to blend that. Like, so here I'm using tiles that are kind of stepping down um, and then that sort of gives the eye the gradual feel of it kind of, you know, diminishing. Um, and then also using a lot of mixtures of jumper plates and regular plates to be able to have that transition happen there. So you can see here, obviously, using the jumper and connecting this one, uh, one by six plate or tile across the top here allows that, you know, transition uh, and kind of ha helps to clamp everything together. And then also um, using this, uh, I, I really like the use of this piece right here, which is the kind of um, the half heart segment piece, which has that one, um, you know, anti-stud in the right in the middle. And then so I'm able to go from the, the two wide at the front here, clamping that onto, um, well, I'm actually using it here in a, in a kind of a weird way to hold on to um, this jumper uh, tile down here. Uh, I forget exactly why I had to do it that way, but there was a reason. Um, but I needed that extra little bit of stability in there. And then also like, you know, the way that this then, um, this one by three goes over the top of that. And then this uh, one by six over the top of that just helps to kind of sandwich everything in together. And again, give that kind of feeling of a gradual stepping down from the, the wider surface down into the thinner one. Um, and that, that was one of the, the things that I kind of figured out a, a bunch of different ways to integrate. So um, here I'm using jumpers and then you can see on uh, inside of this, I'm then sandwiching in between those, those jumpers here. So I have my um, bricks uh, modified with studs on both sides. So I'm then attaching that on top of a jumper and then switching back to, so I have a, a second jumper plate uh, right here facing you know um, this way. And then that allows me to then switch back to the two wide build just to kind of uh, have a second point where this is all attached in together. Then I'm switching back to jumpers again, back to these uh, one wide bricks and then so on. So um, just kind of doing that all throughout as a way to, um, I'm gonna forget how I did this now, uh, just as a way to be able to kind of uh, maintain the strength and the stability um, while you know, also keeping the aesthetics on point and having those transitions not be too um, eye-catching. And you know, a lot of that stuff uh, applies to the, the top wing as well. Um, and here I'm using a, a ratcheting joint simply as a way of bridging the gap here again with the two wide to the one wide. Um, that's another really useful technique for switching because there's a lot of um, stiffness in these joints. So it's almost like you could almost treat it like it's a single piece um, and use it that way, which is what I'm doing here. Um, underneath that, actually, I have one of these Technic uh, five long uh, rounded plates here. So I'm, I'm using that as a another kind of interesting gap filler that um, just needed to fill that specific five long gap. Um, and then because this has the Technic axle in the middle, that's the reason why I'm using this inkwell piece to fill that gap right there, because that's able to fit into that little space. And then I'm also using a sideways uh, headlight brick right here, because those have the uh, those have the fortunate advantage of being the same width as um, two regular Lego plates. So I'm plugging that in there, and I'm using the anti-stud at the back of that to be able to give me that continuous 
studded surface right the way through here that I can plug in this uh, one by three brick. So there's just, yeah, there's just an absolute ton of that kind of stuff where I'm, I'm solving problems of uh, the geometry of, um, you know, building in, in various different directions. So technically this, if you look at it in a kind of traditional Lego way, this is a model that is studs facing up in this direction. Um, and then everything else is sort of, I don't know, figured out all around it. Um, and then the way, uh, the one way here that I'm kind of securing all of the different wing sections together is because I have the, the two wide sections here, here, and here, that are sort of sandwiching in the one wide wing portion. I then have these um, brick heads, bricks at the back, then I'm uh, kind of sandwiching all of those in together and clamping them in with this uh, two by six tile that just gives a lot of extra support to this whole middle section here and makes it very, very secure because it's held in this direction by all of those studs, kind of clamping it in together and keeping all of this nice and secure. So yeah, there's just a ton of that stuff throughout this design and uh, uh, really, really interesting and fun challenges to figure out along the way. Um, and then these are just the Technic, uh, spaced out Technic bricks for the engine. One of the things I really wanted to do is integrate a window into the floor of the Mantis here for the cockpit. And I remembered that I had already done that for the lid here. So I kind of paid attention to the technique that I had used previously to do that. Uh, and it's actually fairly simple. So I'm just relying on uh, a Technic brick in here with two studs. So or the, the, sorry, the two Technic pinholes, right? Those are also able to accommodate Lego studs. So I'm using that right in here to attach uh, on this side. And then I'm just filling out with a plate here the, the kind of geometry to get this to be long enough so that it can then meet up with a regular uh, brick with studs on the side on this end right here. And then um, that was simply, you know, just kind of lucky Lego math that it all worked out uh, the way that it should. So let me just show you there. Uh, just a regular one of these bricks with studs on the side and then that, that plate in there just allows it to fit perfectly into place where it should be. And that is not something that I planned. It's something that I just tried out and then I was like, oh, well, if I put a single plate in there, maybe that'll get, get it to the right width. And sure enough, it worked. So uh, that's like a ton of the things that I end up going with are things that I am not sure will work when I first attempt them. And then afterwards, I'm like, you know, good thing that worked out because uh, I really wanted to achieve it and I didn't know how to do it until I tried. Um, that's kind of one of the reasons that I, I struggle building digitally actually is that I really like to be able to try things out with the bricks in my hands. I, I'm not very good at planning things out and visualizing uh, beforehand. So I, I need to just experiment with the plastic. Um, and then another little interesting technique is the way that I did this double grill vent here. So in the actual Mantis design, the vent goes all the way down to the surface of this window and it meets up very, very seamlessly like you can see right here. And so I'm using the uh, underside of one of these hinge bricks, so the, the actual hinging plate part, because it is extremely thin, but it's also a two by two surface that gives me four studs, so I can attach the front grills to it and then uh, the back grills can be attached to the regular clip that is holding this whole assembly in place. And it just uh, gives it enough room at the front there so that all of this can come down and just sit right exactly where it needs to be. So I was very happy when I figured that out. Um, and yeah, I, I definitely enjoy the look of that, the way that it all kind of blends in so seamlessly. Um, yeah, so very cool. Uh, and also this isn't a technique, but I could not have, uh, I could not have achieved this nice kind of blending of the wider and narrower sections of this engine without this relatively new part. So Lego, please keep giving us more interesting, weird combinations of angles, wedges, cut plates, curved things, and compound angles. Because, um, you know, pieces like this couldn't have even been conceived of by Lego 20 years ago. But now we have a ton of different kinds. And, you know, the more the better, because it allows us to fill all kinds of different weird little holes and, um, you know, keep designing weirdly shaped things. So yeah, that's awesome. So up at the front end of the Mantis here, these uh, front tip cannons used to break off all the time. So what I'm doing now is I'm using one of these inverted Technic pin modified plates uh, with, so I'm using two back to back and a regular Technic pin in there uh, in the middle and those can accept a Lego bar like so. So I'm just um, relying on that to hold the cannons in place exceedingly securely. So once those are in there, they're not going anywhere. Um, and then I'm just, uh, relying on the fact that there's a just a slight gap here, so it's a, a, just a one stud and a tiny, tiny bit gap 
um, under here to attach the secondary cannon, um, which is just held in with one stud. So ordinarily, you'd be able to break that off very easily. But because this is held in so securely right beneath it, it sort of wedges it in there and it stops it from coming out. And then this ends up being now a very secure, nice assembly um, and you know a, a great improvement on what was there before, definitely. Um, oh, and I also did integrate these cheese slopes in here for this little front slopey window detail. Uh, that was also a fun detail that wasn't present on the first one. And I just like it, I dig it. So there you go. So for the new design for the hollow table, uh, I wanted to get this angled display screen slash console here that exists on the real thing. And so the best way to do that was using the same technique that I used for my um, Book of Boba Fett back to tank, where I'm using one of these new jumper um, or like minifigure angled jumping display type pieces that uh, very handily now come in dark or light bluish gray. So that just simply attaches and gives me the stud to attach this little um, fun decorated tile at a 45 degree angle. So I really appreciate that. And then for the actual internals of this, um, it took me so long to figure out exactly how that I wanted to attach because I knew I wanted to, to have these um, three wide um, builds here for the, the, you know, the curved sides of the, the rounded table here. And it took me an embarrassingly long amount of time to remember that I could just use a one by two modified brick with plates on both sides, which I've used a bunch of throughout this design for the for the wings to hold everything together. Uh, and then that would just give me enough studs to hold these uh, sections on without them falling off. Uh, because previously, uh, I can't remember what I did for the design before, but I only had one stud on here and it was just, so the thing would just kind of swivel if you knocked it. So then this uh, double stud here allowed me to just be able to attach this nice and secure and then give me the space on the top here to plug in my inverted little hollow map. And again, using those same pieces as I did for the display, but this time in the trans clear to give me the positionable planets. And uh, I thought that was a really cool idea because in the, in the game, it isn't just a simple matter of like a wheel spinning around. The map kind of twists and changes shape when you zoom in on a different planet. Things sort of come in and out um, in different ways. And so I think have, being able to kind of arrange the planets a little bit more haphazardly um, can kind of give a little bit of that feel of the sort of digital display that we see actually on the ship. So um, I don't know, I think, I think that works uh, immensely better than what was there before. And, uh, and uh, I think this is probably my most improved prop for the, the new design. Very, very happy with this. One little technique that I used for the kitchenette that I really liked is using, again, these hinged bricks. So one right in here and then one in the base to attach this uh, little simple build here sideways that gives me the little um, dispensers, the food dispensers that are these basically three vertical black boxes that are in the wall and uh, just gives me the ability to attach it very, very seamlessly uh, without, and without it having any sort of uh, angle that you can sort of, um, what am I trying to say? G uh, basically keep it at a predetermined angle due to the fact that these are ratcheting hinge pieces. Uh, so that just keeps it upright uh, and attaches it in a very low profile way that doesn't take up a ton of the space of this area. Plus on the back wall here, the microwave sits right in here. So um, it just kind of all fits exactly perfectly the way that I need it to. And then uh, I'm using this bracket piece here as a space filler because there's the sloping wall that comes up next to it. So this just fills up a little bit of the gap that would exist there. And same goes for this piece. I'm just using it as a space filler to um, kind of make the kitchen seem a little bit more complete when you look in these back edges here, not, not so gappy. Um, so yeah, that's that. Uh, really still happy with the kitchen area overall. And uh, let's move on to the next part. So the next thing I wanna talk about is these curved couches that you see here. So there's two identical builds for those in the Mantis because there are two identical couches. And uh, the way that I did these using um, a combination of hinged plates underneath um, this is actually not missing by mistake. That's actually something that require, is required by the design to be missing. Um, uh, yeah, so a combination of these hinged plates and then also wedge plates. So you can see here, the wedge plates set the angle that the uh, second section of the couch will come up to. And then I'm using a combination of plates and uh, cheese wedges in here to just kind of fill out that back section and using again, one of these very, very useful headlight bricks. The reason I'm using a headlight brick in here as opposed to a regular one by one brick with uh, modified with stud is that uh, these headlight bricks are offset by a half plate 
uh, kind of there cut in a little notch right there. And that notch allows these um, two parts to come together and meet in the exact, uh, you know, kind of with the angle there that I want and fill that gap up as close as possible. And there's this tiny little bit of overhang in the back. Um, but when you're looking at the couch when it's actually in place, you don't really notice that. And uh, typically, for a design like this, uh, that would be a problem because I'd probably be sitting this up against a flat wall. But since uh, the walls of the mantis are angled outwards, you know, from the bottom coming up, uh, that is actually a gap that is allowed to be in there for this design. So it all just worked out absolutely perfectly. So um, previously, I did have a second brick right here, and the um, this design instead of being an L-shaped end piece actually had a full finished. Um, you know, it was a, a two by two plate that was in here instead of the L-shaped uh, bracket. But then I realized the space that I needed this to go into if I wasn't going to change the overall dimensions of the body required that little bit of cut out on the edge um, so that it could fit in against the wall that is in there. So like so. And then you can see here the, the way that the floor needed to be with the tiles and the arrangement of all of that in there is why that stud is missing on the underside of this because it just 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 sits over this little one by one tile right here so there wasn't room to put that uh, gray stud under here but it is nicely supported because it is sitting on top of this tile and that just works out very well and there's not really anywhere for these sides of the, the couch to go just by virtue of how it's all kind of wedged in there and that actually works out great because when you say you want to sit a character right here you don't want this whole kind of flappy <laughs> action happening here on the side of the couch you want it all to be kind of held in there uh, nicely and uh, for the most part it is, so that worked out really well. And uh, the section behind here does hinge uh, open a little bit, so I'm gonna show you guys uh, the design for these in a second, but these back ones are held in place um, using a different technique, but these are kind of more free to move just a little bit. So um, I don't know, that just kind of was like, uh, you know, even in case there was a little bit of impact from those cheese wedges pushing up against this, there would be a little bit of leeway, but I ended up not needing it. Um, and, and I just felt like this section, these uh, sides of the walls are small enough that they don't really need to be pinched in at the bottom. They hold themselves where they need to be nicely, whereas these larger sections back here needed some extra securing. So I'm gonna show you guys that next. So back here I have this wall, and this is the wall where uh, Cal's bunk is. So I'm using the, uh, the, in, uh, the cut in kind of uh, panel piece here to give room for Cal's arm um, and uh, and then the, r the rest of the wall acts as both a support for these panels that go along the front section of the ship and also as um, a support and a kind of a bridge to the back side of the ship so the first stud in the middle here or the the stud on the innermost side is used to attach to the front panel and the stud on the outside or sorry the, the hole uh, is used to attach to the walls that come back this way so this is really uh, interesting sort of bridging of the two halves of the ship um, and the way that this all worked out geometry wise is very very difficult to uh, figure out the geometry of angling a piece like this and having uh, the ability to plug in a Technic pin um, on both sides top and bottom uh, and have the the math line up exactly right and I did try a few different um, methods uh, to kind of get this to line up exactly so I would be using a Technic pin top and bottom um, and that would have made it super duper secure. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get it quite right. And so what I ended up, uh, I kept having was just a little bit of stress and tension that would want to pull the, um, mainly this wall actually is where I noticed it most, where uh, yeah, the, the top and bottom sections of the wall would want to just pull themselves apart slightly uh, due to this tension in here. So what I ended up doing is at the bottom, Actually, I may have to tear this off. Oh, hang on. Okay, so I removed some pieces here, and you can see. So um, I'm using one of these uh, bar pieces with the stud to just uh, insert into the bottom Technic pinhole that I have here, and then that is obviously secured to the hole itself. Let me just go ahead and place that back in place, like so. Um, so all this does is it acts as a barrier to stop this thing from moving, and it can't go out any further than that, uh, but it doesn't rely on having the exact right um, math and geometry of, uh, you know, for the Technic pin above where that fills the uh, Technic hole perfectly. This is more of just like a spacing uh, stopper, which I think is something that I saw used to really good effect in the UCS Razor Crest, and I thought it was a really good idea to just kind of have these, um, these guides in here to keep things in the right place that don't necessarily have to link up the exact correct way, uh, top and bottom, 
you know, just kind of avoids a little bit of fiddling around with the math. So <laughs> that's that. Uh, and there you go. So another fun part of this design was rethinking the ramps. Uh, so the with the landing gear and everything, the way that the, the new design is, the, the ramps wanted to be a little bit longer than the previous ones. And um, I just, I don't know, I wanted to rethink it a little bit and give it this extra kind of actuator that comes out here like so to um, open up the, the flap at the bottom. Um, and one of the fun ways of thinking about how to get this to work was, um, you know, how it was going to integrate at the top. And luckily, um, so I needed a plate under here to uh, meet up with the bottom side of this, uh, this main door plate to stop it from going in any further. And previously I had a 1x4 in there, and then I realized oh, I could just take that out and put two 1x2s in, and then that middle gap right there would give me the space to add the hinging portion here. So I have these plates in here, um, you know, which is something that just worked out absolutely perfectly. And then uh, because I have the little bit of, uh, first of all, because this is built upside down, and then I have these clips sitting in here with a little bit of a gap, so there's a plate of thickness between the clip and the main part of the door, the kind of outer part of the door there. It gives it the room that it needs to be able to be in there and move freely. And then also, like I said, just perfectly tuck underneath in that little gap. And once it is tucked in, you can also just, if you're planning not to use the doors for a while, you can bring these up. So they really just look like part of the ceiling. Um, and you know, it's, it's like a really nice kind of tucked in design feature that doesn't really draw attention to itself until you actually open it up and then you're like, oh, I'm not done yet. I can actually open these as well. So um, yeah, I'm just really, really happy with how all of that turned out. And again, just using the, um, the tile in here and then also the inverted tiles on this section gives it as much of a flush look as I think you need for it not to be distracting. And then this middle section here could just be like the texture of the kind of metal grates that uh, stop you from slipping. And it all just kind of feels right for, uh, for a door ramp, I think, for uh, something in Star Wars. So. There you go. And then, yeah, having having the studs built into this uh, four by four um, modified tile here, that actually helps because it gives you a place to grab the door from, uh, you know, easily from the outside. So yeah, yeah, I couldn't be, couldn't be happy with how all of that turned out. Um, or maybe I could, I don't know, but for now I'm very, very satisfied. <laughs> so there you go. And it's such a small detail, but I really, really like the flower box um, because it's, it's such a specific shape and so hard to capture and just using the, the relatively new one wide bracket pieces that um, came out just in the last few years enabled me to make a nice tall thin sleek plant box with even has the indication of a, a light up here that would be illuminating the plant and keeping it uh, you know nice and healthy um, and it just I, I'm just very very happy with it and when you put it in place down here in the ship uh, the the reason I actually added that uh, clear tile for the the light indicator there is that it would uh, kind of wedge this bracket in place against the edge of this counter here and keep it from wanting to fall off in this direction uh, because previously, you know, because this is only held in, in here with one stud, this bracket would want to fly off in this direction and so that clear tile helps to just kind of sandwich it in there and it, it stays nice and secure now. So that's that. One tiny little thing in here that I thought was fun, not necessarily a technique per se, but um, the way that I was thinking about integrating the orange frames around this plant box here, and then I just ended up using one of those quarter round tiles to give the indication that the frame is continuing and then being interrupted. Um, I don't know, I just thought that worked out very nicely. And I also thought it was fun the way that I attached the uh, flower in here to this Technic uh, axle hole brick in the middle here, and I just used one of these um, relatively new bar pieces with the stud on the end to attach the flower in there and then the flower box goes around it like so. And I just, I don't know, uh, something about that was just very, very satisfying when I figured it out. This whole space here just has a lot of fun uh, interactions of, of shapes and things and I, I dig it, so there you go. Uh, one interesting shape that I ended up developing for uh, a support piece that goes towards the front, this is actually what sits right behind the cockpit, is, um, is this shape right here where I'm using one of these um, relatively old uh, pieces here with the studs in the back. And I always forget that these have these, or I guess anti-studs in the back, uh, that allow you to plug something into the back of it. And I always thought it was a kind of an odd way that it was configured because you can't attach anything all the way down. So I end up not using these very often, but uh, what I did do in this case is attach these two pieces here. So it's a regular one by one brick with stud modified and then a uh, one of these brick heads, um, one wide 
modified bricks here, and those fit perfectly into the back uh, studs like so. And then that just enables this to be a much, much stronger piece to support uh, the weight of what's happening on top, um, and also just clamp into the, uh, the floor in a way that just makes it much more useful as a structural piece than if it was just you know this on its own, uh, which with the single stud here offers very, very little actual like structural support. So um, I just thought that was a fun way to kind of boost uh, the usefulness of these pieces, um, which are of course already very, very useful. Um, and people have probably thought of that before, but I just thought that was a fun little shape. So uh, yeah, I get a kick out of this when I look at it. So one thing that I knew I wanted to do early on is to design these particular panels using wedge plates to capture the specific angles of the white against the blue and get the uh, yellow striping in here. So I knew that I was going to have to plug these panels in at an angle somehow. And what I was really, really happy to find out is that when I plug these in at the exact right angle, uh, using, of course, I, I purpose built all of the structure up here to um, have the the rounder elements, where is my plate here? So, um, you know, I'm using these to hold in these side panels and continue that nice round shape all the way around there. Um, and then, yeah, I, what I was pleased to discover is if I put this Technic uh, brick down here with the two studs, and then I just place this panel in here, if I used these modified rail pieces, I was able to get it to sit right up against the bottom of that plate and hold it in there at the exact right angle keeping it wedged in um, perfectly. Like it, it never needs to, it never wants to move. It's just, it's held in there. <laughs> and it's just a complete fluke and piece of luck that I was able to figure out that that would fit in there exactly the way that I needed to. And, and just, yeah, it's just one of those pieces of Lego serendipity that I just could never have uh, foreseen, but I just kind of fumbled my way through it until I found a solution that worked. And there it is. And that that way that this kind of comes down and goes into the blue here. It's one of the most satisfying parts of the ship for me, and I'm just absolutely thrilled that I was able to get that to work, and that I didn't just have to rely on regular old, you know, um, inverted slopes or something like that to capture that shape. So, so they, yeah, that's, that's just, again, I mean, look at the, like it was made for it, right? But it definitely was not made for it. And, uh, but it just works. One thing I enjoy doing is finding a way to use stickered parts that I don't really have much use for, in my designs. So what I always try to do is if I have a part um, like this that I need to use for a specific purpose, so here's you know Cal's little arm uh, spacer, um, I had one that had the sticker on it and I know that I'm probably far less likely to use this in a design where I can see this sticker, uh, but I knew that in this case it would be tucked away behind the kitchen counter and so I just went ahead and used that. It was not, uh, you know, it's not obtrusive. Even if you see the sticker you wouldn't really notice it's back there because it's gray. And um, you know, this specific paneling detail isn't really useful to me in a lot of scenarios, so hiding it away back here is much preferable in my eyes to peeling the sticker off. Uh, I only do that when I absolutely have to, like if I'm out of these pieces and I just absolutely need this, I will peel the sticker off. But I like to preserve them just in case the need ever arises. And tucking them away behind other things is a really useful way to make better use of your stickered parts, I think, um, rather than just uh, discarding them or discarding the stickers. So. Uh, yeah, that was just a fun little uh, Easter egg tucked away in there, a sticker nobody knew was there, so <laughs> there's that. Another fun little technique that I've never tried before is I needed to have a sliding mechanism that would um, go back and forth and keep the uh, wings from, you know, breaking. Um, and I had these uh, slider pieces in here, which I've used a million times, so this is the modified brick with the rail kind of cut out of it on the inside there. Um, and the way that the space worked out on the inside of this track I only had three studs in order to um, be able to attach to the top portion, and I really wanted it to be as strong as possible, so I didn't just want to use the two studs here with the standard real modified pieces that I would normally use. So I'm just using a, a two or a, a one by three double jumper piece to fill in that last stud, and then that just you know comes out to the exact right dimensions right there to uh, be able to fit into this modified rail portion right here. And it actually um, has a little bit more friction to it than these uh, rail pieces do. So it ends up actually giving it a lot more of a nice feel of like a very kind of, um, I don't know, it, it gives it a more of a, I guess, a polished feel where it doesn't feel like it wants to rattle at all. It's very like, it's very smooth and it's very slick. So 
uh, really, really happy that I thought of that. It was just such a simple thing, but it never occurred to me that the geometry of these uh, would line up the way that they do here. So um, yeah, there you go, there's that. And the last thing I wanted to just talk about is uh, order of operations. I feel like once I understood that the key to strength, stability, and durability in the LEGO system is all down to controlling the order of operations in which things are put together and the way that they need to be put together in order to fit, um, that is kind of the thing that unlocked uh, I don't know, the whole kind of system for me and allowed me to think like a LEGO designer in the first place. Because what I was noticing is that, you know, four, five, six years ago when I was just kind of really getting my bearings uh, with LEGO as, as coming back to it, um, I was noticing that the way that LEGO sets are put together is so much less, um, it's so much less kind of, I guess, random than the way that th they used to be in the sense that you could almost start at any point on an old Lego set and you would still be able to put the whole thing together and achieve the same result. But not so nowadays, especially with the Technic inner frames of things like larger, things like you know Lambda shuttles and stuff of that sort, it has to be done in a very specific order and it's designed to be that way because you can't just grab it from the wrong angle and tear it apart because your everything is clamped and then reclamped from different directions over and over again throughout the design. And that locking it together, that almost, like I mentioned earlier, the wooden puzzle box, it's kind of like that feel that allows for something to be sturdy enough to hold itself together at this scale when you know it's doing crazy stuff. Um, and so one of the things that I was most proud of is the way that this uh, back section is basically a brick <laughs> of Lego, uh, at least this, um, this sort of blue and white stripe section through here. It's very, very, very solid. Then you have to do the, the spine, uh, the central spine here, these six wide uh, rings on the inside, each of which of those sections has to be put on in a specific order with uh, intermittent parts that lock it in place. So then this, the spine is very secure. Then you have to put the first blue ring, then the white ring, then the wing, then the second blue ring. Then you're holding this frame in place uh, against the Technic central frame. Then you're plugging in these um, iframe pieces right here, and then into that, I'm then attaching a Technic T frame uh, or a T shaped uh, Technic arm in here, which has these three, so it's kind of um, pinched into the design there, uh, and then it has these three Technic, uh, I guess, modified Technic pins with the axle holes in the end. So then, in order to attach the entire front end of the ship, I'm relying on this large section here of frame where it's all built around this central one piece, this Technic hollow box that when it's plugged in underneath here, allows me to attach it in a way that can't be undone by the use of these pins that pokes into uh, the three Technic holes on the inside of that, um, you know, of, of that box. So in that way, like nothing that I've built up to this point can really be taken apart. This is all locked in at every single stage with different directional building that um, is just kind of, it's just a way of thinking and a way of organizing your mind when you're going through and making a model like this so that you know that what, what comes next can't be undone by what came before. Like, and you know, this now this um, piece of the frame right here that I can build on, it's extremely, extremely solid because not only is it studded in underneath, it's held in with the pins in this direction and all of the weight of this frame under here is all keeping it in place and, um, and, and keeping all of this in place too, which allows it to rotate smoothly um, because you know it's, uh, it's not able to move in any direction and it keeps it very, very solid. So um, yeah, that's just kind of the thing that has been a revelation for me more recently is figuring out more and more how to control the order of building. And it also helps me when I'm making the instructions as well to understand how to um, how to approach things in a way that makes sense to the builder, where you're uh, you're building in a way that it needs to be, you know, it can only be one way in order to actually succeed. So, I don't know. It just kind of is a an interesting thought, I guess, when you're planning out how to build a mock. <laughs> you're not just thinking about what looks good and slapping it on. Uh, you have to think about the stages, and um, and yeah, that's kind of my main takeaway. So. Yeah, that's about it, really. <laughs> I don't have much more to say about the Mantis. Sorry, this went on for quite a while, but um, but yeah, I just had a lot of interesting thoughts that I had along the way, and of course, by no means 
am I uh, saying that I'm some kind of Lego genius? It's just that, um, you know, I've picked up a lot of things along the way and I'm enjoying passing some of those on to you guys. And hopefully when you do buy my instructions for things, uh, I hope that there are techniques and things in there that um, help you guys to further your own Lego building ambitions, teach you a thing or two. That's at least my goal. Um, so yeah, if you have learned anything from my videos or from my or videos or instructions in the past, uh, let me know down in the comments. I'd love to know if I've inspired any uh, interesting thoughts or experiments or techniques in your own mock making. That's um, obviously a really cool bonus if you guys are uh, getting something extra out of it. That makes me happy. So yeah, I'd love to know about it. Let me know down in the comments. All right, so that's going to do it for today. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. The instructions for the Mantis are in progress right now. As you can see, I have torn it all apart for the uh, purpose of doing that. So um, hopefully it won't be too long now before you can get your hands on the new version of the Mantis and start gathering your parts. Uh, thank you guys again so much for watching. I'll see you on the next video, and may the Force be with you. Thank you.